Welcome back. I hope everybody is in the midst of a city that is based on a musical piece. Um, I hope you're not too frustrated or there's not too much friction in that assignment. I hope there's just enough friction because if there was no friction, that's a problem also. So I hope you're having fun with it, though. I can't wait to see them. Um, I was told I have three hours to speak today, so I'm hoping that's okay with I'm going to try to keep it to like 45 minutes, but I'm going to be blowing through some stuff pretty quick. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I just sort of reintroduce myself. I'm Frank Jacobus. Um, for the faculty here, I don't know how many of you saw my, the students saw my lecture when I was applying for the position here, but I'm going to tell some of the same stories that I told in that lecture, but I've changed it up just a little bit. But so apologies to the faculty for having to hear a couple of stories again from me. But I'm titling this uh, talk, We See Ourselves, If Only. And I'll describe a bit towards the end what I mean by that. So start with a couple of stories. Uh, young, as a young faculty member, poor, although with hair, uh, faculty member, I moved from this tiny house in Moscow, Idaho, to a little bit bigger house, and that little bit bigger house had uh, a dining room, like a dining area, let's say. It wasn't really a room, but it was a little area that we could actually have a dining table. Our previous house was super small, only had the area for like a little breakfast table. So I didn't have any money, you know, we didn't want to just go out and buy a dining table, so we got a dining table from my aunt in Seattle. She drove us to see us and brought her dining table. And we moved all our stuff into this house and unpacked all our boxes. And it kind of reminded me, I wanted to show this again because it reminds me of my life now. Like if you came over to my house right now, you walk in, boxes everywhere, packaging paper everywhere. It's still, it's chaos in there, right? The same situation, I had taken all these boxes, put them in the garage. And I finally had a dining table. My aunt brought us that. But we didn't have any dining chairs. I had nothing to sit on. Uh, we, I could have gone to Walmart or Target and bought dining chairs, but ultimately I thought, I've got all these boxes in the garage. I'm a designer. I can just think up a dining chair and go make it, right? And so many X-Acto blades and lots of blisters later, I made these dining chairs. I made four of them, but I'm showing you two of them here. We call them the getaway chairs because this was a house on getaway court, right? And I, I thought about this, and, and I tell the story in some ways because I think it tells you a bit about me. And it tells you a bit about what I hope for you. What I hope for you is that you'll think of everything as a design opportunity, everything that you confront in life, all these challenges that you have in life. I hope you think of them as a design opportunity. Everything is design. And so what you're studying right now is so powerful because what you're learning how to do is solve problems by design, right? You're learning how to solve uh, things that confront you as problems in your life. So I like to say designers make designs, not excuses. We can always figure out ways or reasons why we can't do something. Ah, oh, the client doesn't have any money. I don't have a big enough budget. I didn't have a million dollars. I had eight hundred thousand dollars. I didn't have five hundred thousand. I had three hundred thousand. There's always a reason why we can't do something. But we have to change the way we approach the world. There is a reason why you can't build a million dollar thing for eight hundred thousand dollars. But there's no reason why we can't figure out how to build it for eight hundred thousand or build it for a hundred thousand. We have to change the way that we have to change the thing we want, right? And so now that I'm in this new move, maybe this is my life. I just kind of move and have boxes throughout my life. I don't know. But I'm in a new period where I'm now, I just moved to Pennsylvania. And now I'm working with these AI tools that I'm sure a lot of you are working with too. Mid I did this in mid-journey. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be cool if I did another project? And the, you know that brown packaging tape that's super glossy? What if I took all the garbage paper from my move, which I'm already starting to collect in, in big garbage bags. And I make like a beanbag chair and I wrap it in this, this kind of shiny brown tape. So maybe, maybe I'll have some of you help me with this project. What if I took the packing paper, by the way, for your Corbelletti drawings, that packing paper we got in little rolls like this, that's gorgeous paper, the cheapest paper you can ever imagine. It's really beautiful paper. But what if I took it and, and made a chair like this out of it, right? Designers are opportunists. That sounds like an insult. Like if somebody called you an opportunist, somebody actually, maybe after, what is this, five years ago now in my life, called me an opportunist. It, that was so insulting when that person <laughs> said that to me. You're, 
Franks and opportunists. And I started thinking about it, and I'm like, hopefully not in the Dantean sense, like I'm going to be burning in hell because of my opportunism, but like, yeah, I'm an opportunist. When I go to a site, I see opportunity. When I come to a school, I see opportunity. That's what I want you all to be, too. Everything you confront, there's opportunity in that, right? Any challenge you confront, there's opportunity. So we call people opportunists. It's an insult. Thank you. I'm an opportunist. Like, I see opportunities in things, and I love that, right? The second story is about my grandfather. Uh, I didn't know either of my grandfathers. They died uh, before I was born. One of them died just after I was born, but I never met him. Um, and that one is named Richard Staples Dodge. So he did these sculptures. Um, and he was an artist, basically a starving artist in New York, could never figure out how to make money, uh, died relatively young. Um, but we had all this artwork in our house growing up. These, my mom, would, it's my mom's father. My mom would always call them, as weird as this is, daddy's heads. Well, it's a strange thing, but as a kid, that's what they were, daddy's heads. I just knew them as that. It wasn't ever strange to me. But when I gave the talk here in the spring and I said it out loud, it was like, that's a little weird, daddy's heads, right? But we had these heads floating around our house. Uh, probably tells you a little bit about me. But anyway, we had the heads on shelves and stuff floating around our house. And it dawned on me at some point in my life, I know this person. I would never met him, and I know this person. Uh, I could tell what his personality was like. I could tell... Like, this is a person you want to have a beer with, right? This is a person who you want to have lunch with. You want to hear the stories. This guy was funny. This guy was like an interesting character. I mean, look at these little sculptural heads, how much personality these things have. So anyway, at some point in my life, I started being super interested in this idea that the made object, these things right here, can have so much life and personality. And how does that happen? And it gets back to some of the stuff I was talking about in the last lecture, just about how lines, forms, shapes, textures, colors work in the world. Um, then at some point I read this uh, book called Range, and there was a quote in there that says, I know who I am when I see what I do. And I remember reading that and thinking to myself, first of all, that seems like an odd sentence. It doesn't seem like it's worded right or something. That was my first instinct. Now that I've read it about 50 times, I, I, it makes sense to me totally, but like, I just felt like it was off. I know, what I, I know who I am when I see what I do. But I started thinking about this. Totally true, right? You are doing things in the world right now. Here's what I mean, or here's what I think David Epstein means by this quote. If you're nice to other people, you're a nice person, right? If you're genuine to other people, you're a genuine person. If you, if you make a lot of sculptures, you're a sculptor. If you make paintings, you're a painter, right? You don't need a degree or certificate to tell you you're that. You are the things that you do in this world. That's what you are, and that's what you're doing right now. You, you, are, you are part of your work that you bring into this world. And so I realized that I knew this grandfather better in some ways than the other one because of the work that they brought into the world. And at some point, I had a chance to build a house for my parents. And uh, pretend like you don't see the heads at the bottom here, because I showed my mom and dad this top portion of, of, the, of the slide there. And my mom immediately said, I hadn't told her anything that I was doing, like any idea behind the project or anything, and she goes, oh my god, it's daddy's heads. So she recognized what I was doing in the project just by the form itself. The end caps of these things, you can see the Roman nose and the eye and the mouth and the same thing here. And the end caps of this became Richard Staples Dodge's heads, abstract versions of those things. And she read that into it. She's not a, an artist. She doesn't draw, create, make, right? She, she just read it into that. And what I was doing in this house was embedding in the house all these different things that my parents had told me were important to them. The red of the New England barns, they both grew up in Connecticut. Uh, the, the salt box at her mom, salt box house, salt box form is, a, I think many of you know this, but high south side uh, roof and low slung uh, north side roof to protect against those harsh winters, right? And that's what this garage portion became, the red of the barns, all these other forms that were embedded in this because this to my parents, my parents are in their late 70s right now, and they said, this is the last place we're going to live. This is the place we want to live for the rest of our lives, right? And so 
I wanted them to live in that history, live, live with that stuff that was special to them. And so we built the house around that. Uh, when I was out there, the house was under construction one day, and there was a gentleman sitting right here. Now, none of the red was on there, and I pulled in right here. It was all rock uh, driveway. This guy looked like he could kill me, and he looked like he was going to kill me. Then that's not a good combination. Um, and so I get out of the car, and, of course, I'm, I'm Mr. Nice Guy, so I'm like, hey, how's it going? You know, even though he had a scowl on his face. Hey, what's going on? And uh, he says, I just don't think that you need to have metal on the roof, metal on the walls, metal everywhere. Like, just choose one. Oh, my God. I, I could have said, who the hell are you talking to? Like, uh, you know, what's going on here? I, I didn't even say anything to you. Uh, I said, well, this house is for my parents. I'm the architect of this house. It's for my parents. And my parents have lived in Connecticut. This is like their last place, right? And I wanted to, and I told him the, the, a very, very short version of the story I just told you. And he looked at me, this guy who just looked <laughs> super angry. He looked at me and he goes, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So that's another thing we do in this world. Is we tell stories about things that attract people, to, that make people want to be with us and do things with us, right? This guy was the metal worker on this house. He could have been working on that metal thinking, why? Why is the roof like this? Why is the wall like this? But instead he said, that's an important thing for this family, right? That's an important thing for them. I want to be a part of this. I want to do better at this. I want to be a good craftsperson within this project. Things, forms that we make in the world are so powerful and important. That's what I study. That's what I enjoy thinking about, right? Things are things. I'm about to say a couple things that it would take probably a semester class to really dig into, but things are things. There's a reason why those two words are so close in terms of their letter formation. I'm going to make a statement here, and by the way, just a disclaimer, I'm going to make several vast unsubstantiated claims during this lecture that I'm just hoping you trust and believe, or you can meet me in the hallway and we can have a discussion about them. Things are things. Here's one of the unsubstantiated claims. Without things, objects, physical forms in the world, we cannot think about the world. We have no capacity to do so. All of our thinking comes through physical form. We are good abstract thinkers, but we're abstracting out of the physical and into the intellectual. It doesn't happen the other way around. We don't intellectualize and then feel. We feel and then we intellectualize. That's the order of operation. The things that you're making in the world allow you and others to think about the world in certain ways. That's how important it is what we do as architects in this world. Forms, this is my invention, although I'm getting it from John Dewey and, and Arnheim and William James and many others, but this specific expression, forms are sticky, I think is mine. I don't know. I've never heard it from anybody else, but forms are sticky. Think of them like that. Our ideas are these loose things, elusive but they stick to things, and that's how we can remember them. That's how memory and imagination is born, right? William Carlos Williams says, no ideas but in things. I always have loved that expression, but to be honest, like for 15 years, I had no idea what he meant by that. I kept thinking about it and thinking about it and had no idea what he meant. And there's probably a lot of things that he means by it, but one thing I learned is you've got to read that literally. No ideas but in things. In other words, without forms, we cannot ideate. That process doesn't exist, right? Forms are foundational in our lives. And so oftentimes when, when somebody gives a lecture about a project like this, they'll talk about the project and explain the project itself. And that's great. But we also need to learn to be present in these things and be with these things and understand that the explanation is not the thing. It's the thing that's beside the thing. No matter how we explain this, it still sits there for us, and it still acts on, on us. It works on us in various ways. So I could tell you, like, a project we did for a testimonial booth at the Faye Jones School is about the Faye Jones void. Faye Jones is famous in part for this voided uh, intersection of a truss where the, the most uh, important point of that truss becomes an actual void, and that a lot of the forms here are bar borrowed from that and borrowed from the filigree that Faye Jones would use in his projects, and that 
the surface here, which you can't see really well right now, but the surface here was all these images from the school's history collapsed into a single surface. And so it's like taking all this information from the school's past and just trying to just collapse it into a thin thing, almost like, you know, just after the Big Bang, trying to scoop everything and push it back together into this thin surface, right? I could tell you all that, or you could just be there with it. You could run your hands over the, the zip ties that held the whole thing together, right? Like, we tend to think in academia and intellectually that the intellectual stuff is superior, right? But there's nothing superior to running your hands over those zip ties and the feeling you get from that. Think about that for a second. Like, there's nothing superior to that. I, the way I explain it is this. Would you rather intellectualize hugging or would you rather be hugged? Which one would you rather do? Academics, part of our job is to try to figure out what the hug means. That's what we're doing, right? That's great. I do that all the time. What does hug mean? Hey, that person just hugged me. What does that mean? You know, I might try to figure that stuff out. We're intellects. We try to figure that stuff out all the time. But we can't get so caught up in trying to figure out what the hug means that we forget to hug, right? We've got to embrace and, and feel, and that's part of what we're doing here, right? So we have to not only explain the things, that's important, but we have to thing the things. We have to make things. We have to experiment with things, physicalize things in this world. This is why I told you on Monday, this, I showed you this quote from Paul Clay. The work doesn't equal the law. The law is the stuff that we're explaining. And that's all great. And sometimes you get such a beautiful explanation that it becomes above the law, right? But the work itself is above the law. It is the feeling of things that we get. And we can't explain it. Think about what we're doing when we're trying to explain it. A series of words in a linear order that happens over time. Well, these things happen all at once. When we are encountering a chair and a table and a building, it's happening to us all at once. When you explain something, it's happening over time. This is why I gave you the project to try to take a thing that's happening over time in music and collapse it into an all at once. -ness. That's why that uh, project is important to me. When we wrote a book called The Making of Things recently, that's what we talk about. What is the nature of these things? What do they feel like? What is the difference in feeling between these things? So we're, we're using explanation in there. Uh, when, we, when I think about design thinking I, and d d teaching different ways of thinking and what you all learn as designers, I think how magical it is that we learn metaphorical and an analogical and narrative thinking and abstraction and all these different ways of thinking. And when I was a young professor, just right around the getaway chair period in my life, um, I wanted to give a project to students that was, I taught a furniture class, and so I said, how about we make uh, chairs that are based on fruit? And I told the students, the chair has to feel like the fruit, but it can't look like the fruit. So now, some of you are probably frustrated, like, oh my God, this music city, oh my God, what's going on here? Imagine the, hey, you gotta make a chair for me that feels like fruit, but that doesn't look like it. Now, as a young teacher at the time, so I had to make my own version. So this is my chair, the Nana chair based on a banana. I was so scared that this project wouldn't work. But about two days into the project, I got a note from a student who said, you're constraining our creativity. And oh my god, that almost hurt as bad as being called an opportunist. That was one of those things that will stick, stick in your brain forever. And I took a day to think about it. Uh, my feelings were hurt, but I took a day <laughs> to think about it. And I wrote him back the next day, and I said, no, I'm enhancing it because I'm getting you used to the world of constraints, and that's the world that we live in. We live in a world where you don't just get to do whatever you want. You do what you, do what you can within a, in a set of rules, right? Two students specifically embraced this project, the one on the left, Alan Mayhitch, and the one on the right, Destry Teeter. They both embraced it. They both were finalists at the AWFS competition, which is mostly furniture design students competing annu uh, biannually at this event. The chair on the left won first place in that competition. When we think differently, when we push ourselves to think creatively within constraints, really great things can happen in that process. Part of what I love about what we do and about what you are learning is we are so ripe to just question everything about the world, right? We are so ripe to question and build work in that questioning. I wrote two books, uh, one called Archographic, one called Visual Biography of Color. Me and a group of students get together and 
we were just diagramming the world in various ways. So the first one on the left, Archographic, was about diagramming the nature of architecture itself, the profession, and everything about the nature and the discipline. And then the second one, Visual Biography, was about diagramming how color works in the world. So we do like uh, a diagram about all the buildings that Le Corbusier ever built. And Le Corbusier, I think, is the crow or the raven. Uh, so we wanted to do it as a bird flight map. So all the, all the buildings that Corbusier ever built as a bird flight map, starting from when he's born all the way to when he dies here. And that's all mapped into this map. We wanted to look at the Bauhaus diaspora. All the, you know, the Nazis take over Germany, and all of these amazing artists flee. Right? And, and, and the United States, in many ways, benefited uh, from that diaspora. But uh, we wanted to map the phenomenon that happened there. But even looking at things like uh, architects who travel, architects tend to love to travel, right? And so we took architects' travels and we mapped them as star constellations and made them into the night sky, like we're looking into the travels of these architects, right? In the visual biography of color, we would take things like, hey, what if we took all the blue subway lines in every city, every major city on the earth, and we collapsed them onto each other to make a blue city subway map? So one could fairly ask, hey, what are you doing? Why are you wasting your time with that? Like, that seems like an odd thing to do. And I would go back to the idea of the explanation of the hug versus the hug. Sometimes we just do, and things result from what we do, and then we have to look at that thing and be there with it and sense it. And, and sometimes we're going to say, there's nothing there. I don't really, I'm not attracted to it. And sometimes we're going to say, this is amazing just in and of itself as a thing that exists, right? We were looking at Crayola crayons, all the different colors over the years of Crayola crayons. Maybe what this drawing does is it ignites some sort of memory and imagination of our childhood. Maybe it makes us playful again. Who knows? We looked at, because you have to when you write a book on color, all the people named Violet that were famous that we could think of through history. And we did what you're doing in your uh, uh, music into architecture thing. We created a set of rules, and then we played out those rules within this diagram. And then we looked at Jimi Hendrix's Purple Haze and all the different venues that he played Purple Haze. And this, I think, I'm just, this is one of those unsubstantiated claims. This is the first psychedelic diagram ever made, right? I totally don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I, I make that claim. Because what we did with this diagram is we made it look like you could read it, but if you actually tried to read it, you'd find out it makes no sense whatsoever. Luckily, the publisher didn't really know how to read these diagrams, so they didn't actually ask us whether this thing made sense or not. So that was a great part of this. So I hope my being here, I hope what I can inject a little bit of is this idea that we have to put ourselves out in, that, in the world. Like I was saying the other day with this uh, similar image, we have to limit our fear. and We have to ask questions uh, that might get messy, that might get ugly in various ways, right? So I taught a class called The Future of Wood, and in that class, uh, we were looking at 3D printed and cast wood. Just like I said the other day with the resin chairs, I had never 3D printed wood. Matter of fact, didn't even know that one could 3D print wood when I started that class. And then I had just made up, invented like casting wood. I, hadn't, I didn't look into whether anybody had done that or not. But the left is the casting experiments, and on the right side here are the uh, 3D printing experiments. And this is what, just to give you a clear picture of what my soul looked like, for the first 10 weeks of the semester, that's about what it looked like. It's just all gnarled up inside. Um, and, uh, but I told the students at the beginning of the semester, hey, we got to embrace the ugly. This could get ugly. We got to just accept it, right? We're aesthetic people. We, we care about aesthetics, but we got to let ourselves go in places that we wouldn't necessarily allow ourselves to on a, a typical day. You can see here uh, two, uh, Christian and uh, Brock working on this. Uh, this is a perplexing and poopy uh, combo, not a good combo for them. You can see they're frustrated with this. But then things start to arrive a bit, a little chunky, a little poopy still. It's never not going to be poopy, by the way, just to let you know when we get to the end of these slides, it's still kind of poopy. But um, then we get the cast wood. Look at that one on the left. All of a sudden, I realize we got something here. There's some really uh, cool stuff going on. We're starting to test the surface. And then... The 3D printed wood starting to look OK. You know, it's starting to look decent um, for what we're trying to do there. And then the, the end result is this, right? So still ugly. I mean, in my, in my aesthetic book, at least, this would fit into the ugly category with the little metal clips at the bottom and zip ties again and 
like the craft of these things is bad, right? It's, it's just not great. But it is great from the standpoint of how we're exploring um, work in this world and allowing ourselves uh, to, to fit within that kind of ugly category. And ultimately, that project was good for these students, too, because the students' work got published in Architect Magazine, and this was something that uh, a gentleman by the name of Blaine Brownell was super interested in and wanted to write about for architects. So that goes into the resume of those students' uh, work. After we were done with that, though, we thought, well, we spent about $30,000 on equipment. Not all schools can do this. So how do we make this less expensive for people? And so we started thinking of this idea of what we call the proxy chair. Still 3D printed wood, but this time we went and bought a $40 electric caulk gun at Lowe's, and we started spitting out this goopy mix that we made with so basically all this uh, print, 3D printed wood is sawdust that we made a little recipe for. And we're, this, so what you're looking at there is, I think, 65 to 70 percent wood. Uh, and then we started thinking, how do we actually get this wood mixture onto a thing that can become a chair? So we laid this chair out flat and used a bending plywood. And then we would squeeze the stuff on there and then bend it up. And ultimately, it became this. Still probably fits in the category of somewhat ugly, uncontrolled a little bit. Um, and I know what you're thinking, can you sit in that? And the answer is absolutely not. Or uh, like you can, but you, you probably hurt yourself. But the next, um, the next test was, and this, this shows that I come from Arkansas, we were going to latch a fishing reel onto the electric caulk gun and just squirt out and get reinforcing in there. Uh, but then COVID hit, and so we stopped, <laughs> we stopped production. That would have been a, maybe we'll pick it, up, pick it back up here. Um, and so I'm sure there's a lot of good fishing around Pennsylvania as well. You get your fishing lines and reel uh, as well here. So, um, so we accepted the ugly in that one, right? And sometimes you've got to take, take on the challenge of things. Like this project for a uh, little pavilion at the Cleveland Botanical Gardens, it was a treehouse competition. Who could design the best treehouse? And me and my partner chose the one site that didn't have any trees. There was 10 sites, and we chose the one with no trees. And so then the treehouse pavilion itself became the tree because we used reflective material on the inside so the kids could not only see the reflection of themselves playing, but they see the trees being grabbed in reflection from this space beyond. So you get this kind of combo house uh, tree thing going on in terms of it's just uh, sort of formal symbolism. And my point in showing this is I, I hope for you all, I mean, I, I'm this way, but I hope for you all that you take on what you're doing. Like when you say, I got to go work on studio, uh, maybe we start saying, I get to go play studio. Like we play the piano, why can't we play studio, right? We get to go play studio. And imagine yourself, it wasn't that long ago for a lot of you, like imagine yourself when you were six, seven, eight years old playing with friends. You get lost in that environment, right? You come out of that like, Oh my God, you know, you're, you're playing soccer or whatever. You don't, you don't think about, you're not so self-conscious back then. We need to get back there in our design life, right? You're, as you get older, what tends to happen to you, you've got to really guard against this. I was talking to a student at Arkansas maybe five months ago or so, and he says, give me one piece of advice. As I'm going out in the world, he knew I was coming here. One piece of advice, what would you say? And my piece of advice to him was guard against cynicism. As you get older, one tends to become more cynical about things, right? And guard against it. You'll, re you'll, you'll encounter a lot of people who are cynical. You'll encounter a lot of people who, there's always a reason why you can't do something, right? Like if you wanted to make a chair that looked like a cloud, that was a blow-up chair that hung from a string that was filled with helium, and you attach it to a floor that floats in your living room so it looked like a cloud was in your living room, and then when somebody comes over, you pull it down and they sit in that chair, People say, yeah, but, but what about, right? Just guard against this kind of stuff. Just do what you feel like you should do in this world. Beware of the yeah, buts. That's what I call them. It's all one word, yeah, buts. They're the cynics, right? Yeah, but, yeah, but what about, yeah, but. Just be aware of those people because you've got to be willing to do the things that you are compelled to do. And we are living in a world where you've got to be confident enough to do that stuff no matter what anybody says, right? This chair uh, that we built, um, you get four chairs out of one single sheet of Baltic birch plywood. This is a way to drive down cost of furniture, make a little chair that's like a, that's like a puzzle piece, right? I think we should assign these kinds of works to our students. This is a table that I assigned where it's a 30 by 30 inch sheet of Baltic birch. So you get 
uh, four of these tables out of one piece of Baltic birch. And sometimes you break the rules. Kiera, Lures, bottom right, broke the rule. But it was really good, and so I decided to show it anyway, even though it, wasn't, it didn't fit within the, the assignment. It was a really good project, right? So, uh, you know, you've got to be willing to kind of work outside of this uh, zone of people who are going to try to get in your way a little bit as you work. So in terms of the architectural work I've done, the firm uh, really didn't have any clients. We started in like, I think 2014, I can't remember, 2014 or 15, but anyway, didn't have any clients. And so we experimented on ourselves. That's another thing. Don't wait for people to give you commissions. Like right now, this semester, you could build a chair. Some of you I know are going to, but like you can build a chair, right? You could build something, you could build a lamp. You could make something yourself, right? So what we did when we didn't have any clients is we hired ourselves. I built a house for myself. This is my house. I went through like seven iterations of this house, could never afford it. It was always about 15, well, sometimes it was like 200% over budget, but the ones I got closer to were about 15% over budget. So I hired myself as a general contractor. That was about 15%, right? I had never general contracted anything in my life. It was really scary. I was driving a tractor out here. By the way, I don't drive tractors. I've never driven a tractor other than this project. I was driving a tractor right around here, and the tractor nearly dumped over. I was about to bail. I had the, all the dirt in the barrel, and I just went, I mm. <laughs> took that dirt down so that I could try to get off there safely. I made sure whatever it took, I was going to get this project done, right? So you've got to sometimes... Uh, commission yourself to do these things. But as an architect, you also have to be smart. How do we drive down the cost of what we do? How do we make what we do more affordable to more people, right? And so there are a lot of mechanisms that I'm using here to do this. This is just cheap barn metal. There's nothing special about that. We hide all the structure. There's a reason to hide all the structure in these things. You can shape the thing as you want. The minute you start exposing structure, things become more expensive. We hit all the structure. All the trim work is very uh, bare and minimal. Nothing, no detail to speak of. The material palette is minimal. So there's a lot of ways that you can start to drive down the cost of these things. You also, in life, have to choose which direction you're going to look, right? Uh, somebody, one of my colleagues says, um, I know this is a famous expression, but she just reminded me of it a few months ago. She says, why are we looking backwards? We're not headed in that direction. I love that expression. That's a fantastic thing. And so as architects, we get to choose which direction we look, right? There's an extremely ugly house right over here. It's a little bit better now. It's been renovated, but there's, it's still ugly. And so this is our bedroom, the upper bedroom. So I just chose which direction to look. I never see that house because even when I'm in bed over here, the house is not present, right? So we can choose in our lives. Again, this architecture is just a metaphor for our life, right? We can choose which direction to look within these things. Uh, we built the mood ring house. Arkansas is notoriously bad soil. Arkansas's main crop is rocks, and then it's clay, right? And so you build a house in Arkansas, you, can, you spend a lot of money on foundation, on concrete. But first of all, concrete's not very good for the environment. Second of all, why are you spending so much money on it, right? So we just made the foundation smaller. Instead of making it from here to here, we made it from here to here. And then we used LBLs, which are very prevalent now. They're not that expensive in relation to the whole project. And we can't deliver the edges out of that project. So I'm, I think you'll find in me that I'm just interested in a lot of things. I just am curious about a lot of things. And I'm curious about artificial intelligence. I'm curious about talking to you all about how you might use it or what your thoughts are about it and stuff like that. I'm, I'm interested that artificial intelligence tools are metaphorical in nature just like we are. That's, that's intriguing to me, right? Uh, I think I tend to lean, uh, lean towards engagement where, like, if, some, if there's some problem, I want to be engaged. I want to know what's going on in, in, in doing that. And I, that's where I find myself fitting within this uh, artificial intelligence argument. Um, I ask what if a lot. What if we made a chair that looked like an octopus? Yeah, but, yeah, but, you know, who cares? What if we made a chair that looked like an octopus? Let's just try it. Uh, what, if we, what if a building had bird-like qualities? What does it do? How does it change the formal character and the feeling? of that thing. Can we learn how to make an architecture feel like it's taking off like a bird? Um, uh, what kind of forms and spaces might emerge from artificial intelligence? There's a whole, there's probably like 
numerous people who are going to be working on how to construct strange forms based on what artificial intelligence engines are starting to produce in the world. How do we actually construct something like this, right? How do we construct something like this? What is that material on the outside? I have no idea what the machine did there. I don't know why it chose that material on the outside. How does a form like this operate on our psyches? And if we can learn how to build forms like that, maybe with 3D printing, uh, for instance, then how is that going to change the way we live and act in this world, right? Where do things, this is a question that's constantly on my mind, where do things fit within a spectrum of abstraction? From literal or objective to abstract or however you want to create that spectrum, where do things fit in this? There's another fruit chair that Frank's working on. This is more recently, uh, but it's, now it's like a pineapple and it actually looks kind of like a pineapple, right? Uh, how might AI cause worlds to collide? Like you've got, I love those little um, candy corns every like October or whatever they start entering our home and our cupboards. I love those things. And so what is a chair like that uh, is like a candy corn? What is it like to sit in a chair that feels like a candy corn? Or am I addicted to sweets? Is this why I keep doing chairs that look like fruit and candy? Uh, this is a chair that has, uh, that's based on licorice, right? And I love in this the white smiley face in the chair like it's happy because it's eating licorice. So in my work, I just try to follow my gut. Like, what's my gut telling me? What do I feel about this thing? I try to intellectualize it later. Like, if I find myself in the mode where I am thinking too much about something, I try to get out of that mode and just follow my instinct within these things. I don't see distinctions. Like, if, if um, I've gotten this a lot. Like, when I published the Archographic and Visual Biography uh, books, people said, oh, you're a graphic design person. And I make a chair, oh, you're a furniture person. And I don't really s feel that way. I just feel like you make whatever you feel like making in the world, and you start to try to find the connections between things. And so like the hard distinctions between disciplines, that doesn't really interest me that much. I think there's so much more that we have. Like your graphic design colleagues are so similar to you in so many ways. Your landscape architecture colleagues are so similar. They're, they're, we need to be connected more to each other to realize that. Um, and then I'll end with a couple of slides here, but I, and I ended this way for my lecture in the spring here too, but it's a super important uh, way to think about the world as far as I'm concerned, and a soup, uh, like an important person to, for you all to be looking at. And I don't know, maybe you all read John Dewey here already, but I would pick up a book called Art as Experience from John Dewey and just dig into that. It, as a young person, it might be a little tough read, so you've got to let yourself really get in to that read, um, but it'll make sense eventually, and it's, um, he, John Dewey says, anyone who has begun to think places some portion of the world in jeopardy. So just pause for a second and consider that. Anyone who has begun to think, and what have you signed up to do here? Right? You, you've signed up to think, to, to learn how to think, to engage in, in thoughtful exercises, and by doing so, you're taking a world that you knew, and you're putting it in jeopardy. The world you thought was some way, you're now beginning to think it might be another way. Think about it if you're my age, I'm 49 years old, and you begin to discover that the world you thought existed was not true at all. It's hard. It's hard to be that old and, and realize that you've been wrong for 49 years or you've been wrong for however long you've been intellectualizing things on the earth. When we start to think, we place a portion of the world in jeopardy. This, by the way, is our latest house that we've done. Um, I also kind of operate by this thought from Vannevar Bush. Scientific progress on a broad front results from the free play, again, back to that word play, of free intellects working on subjects of their own choice in a manner dictated by curiosity for exploration of the unknown. Like, we have to be building environments where we feel free to act. Now, people are going to tell us that we shouldn't be doing this or shouldn't be doing that. That's always going to happen. But we should feel free to act, and we should feel strong enough to act within these environments. If we do that, we'll know who we are, right? We'll, we'll produce a bunch of work, and we'll know who we are based on the things that we produce in this world. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, that's all. Yeah. And I'm happy to take questions as well. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. I'm a young man? <laughs> that's fantastic. That's, a, that's the best news I've heard all day. Can you tell me how disciplined you are as far as 
compartmentalizing your day as far as writing, sketching, making stuff, making architecture? Reading? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I didn't see a lot. I was looking for a little more process. Yeah. Sketches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With more analog, a little more yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, how disciplined am I in my day about, you know, process, uh, coordinating off time for writing, for drawing, for thinking, for uh, making, modeling, physicalizing? It really depends on the a certain you know stage in my life. Like over COVID, I didn't show any of the drawings, but over COVID, I was doing just tons of digital drawings on iPad. I learned to love drawing on the iPad. I, tr I. I don't, I'm not saying this is healthy, by the way, uh, what I'm about to say, but um, my life in a lot of ways is about the work. Um, I mean, it's about my family first, um, but, you know, if, if, you, if you were to be a fly on the wall in my house, uh, in my normal life, not my life currently here because it's been disrupted a little bit, but my wife would be crocheting. Uh, it'd be, it'd be, we love each other to death, but it'd be very silent. She'd be crocheting, and I'd be drawing, and that's and 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 that would be our evening. That's what we do, or or I'd be building something or making something. Um, and so I don't know that I have any kind of set um, way of acting and working. I kind of throw myself into something, and um, I don't even know whether my process, like in the architecture stuff, is something that I could, I'd, I'd have to kind of think about that and figure out what I typically do there. I sketch a lot. I draw on, I would, you know, I'm, again, I'm older, but I would say for you all, young, younger people, you know, trace paper and, and the uh, paper mate medium flare pen will get you a long, long way. You know, you just draw, 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 draw. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how much I cordon things off. I think it's like, I go through modes. Like I'm in an AI mode now. Like I'm super busy with what I do here, and so my time is limited. So then I'll go into a mode where I can make things. But if I go through periods of like, like this week's hard for me. I have two lectures, a bunch of stuff going on, so I haven't created as much, right? And so when I go through periods like that where I haven't created that much, I get really antsy, and I gotta get something out, done, you know, work on something. And that's just who I am as a as a person, I enjoy, like some, some of you go home and play the guitar. I just, I go home and draw and think about stuff like octopus chairs and stuff like that. So, um, any other questions? Yeah. Um, on the whole degree of like the buildings that we make, they shape us and we shape the buildings. Uh -huh. um, I wanted to like first to the, the metaphor that you put up of the we're thinking things. Yeah. Two things. Yeah. Um, and this will be a mouthful, but. How much us as thinking things that make or do things uh, are those shaping us as thinkers? Uh, if I understand what you're asking, I would say that we, it's, it's, it's so like, it's almost like think about it in a um, washing machine or a, a dryer or something. It's going like, and it's all getting mixed together. Um, we. That, that expression that I showed from Winston Churchill, we shape our buildings thereafter they shape us, we are responding to everything around us in the world intuitively. That's another thing I didn't mention. It's like we over, again, this may be an unsubstantiated claim, and I'm happy to have a discussion or argument with anybody about this, but we overprivilege intellection in this, in this, really in academia, let's say at least. We overemphasize intellection. Intellect is important. It's really important. We underemphasize intuition. If you're not an intuitive person, if you don't build that part of yourself, I don't see you as a designer. I mean, you you'd have a hard time designing, right? A lot of times, what intellects do, who are good designers, is they'll intuit, and then they'll forget the intuition, and they'll think that they've intellectualized, and they'll intellectualize afterwards. But I think it's all a mix. Like somebody said in, in one of our meetings the other day, the problem with these AI tools is that they're just taking things that already exist, hybridizing and making new things out of them, right? That's what we do. You don't invent things from scratch. You invent things from what you've seen and what you've experienced, but you've just forgotten the experience. You're not, into, it's, you're not holding that all in your brain. And it's getting absorbing into you, and then you're intuiting, and things are coming out of you, right? But 
things are coming out of you because you have, think about every experience you've ever had throughout the course of your life. It's, it's, it's billions of the trillions of experiences. And that's just flowing out of you. And that's what's happening with intuition. So yeah, we make in, in the world based on the things that we've experienced and seen and felt and heard and all that stuff. And then we also react to the things that we make and it changes our thinking. We react to those environments and it changes our thinking. So it's just kind of a continuous loop. You know, I don't, did I answer your question? That's a, it's just this constant mixture of all of these things that are it's always happening. I just don't like it when it's, there are problems with AI, don't get me wrong, but one of the problems is, is not necessarily, there's a problem if we're taking people's work, not crediting them, that is a problem. But the, taking people's work and not crediting them is also something we do every day accidentally. That's something we do. The house that you saw, the white house that I showed that's my house, that came from a thirst for these Japanese modernist architects. I love these people. It's looking at so much of that work. It, it just flows out of there. So do I say, can we track that? Oh, that was uh, MA style. That was Toyoito. That was, no, that's not how it works. It's too complicated to really track it like that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all this big mixture. Any other questions? Yeah. So when you're throwing out these ideas, like let's make a chair that feels like a banana. Yeah. Um, what do you see? Basically, do you see it as your responsibility to find a way to tie that into larger conversations about architecture or about social mm -hmm. issues? Or is that someone or are you just like, I'm putting it out there and someone's yeah. going to make something of it? And if you do have a responsibility that you yeah. feel, what is it? That's what a great question. I love that question. So did everybody hear that when I'm inventing ideas or something? What is my responsibility to say? How does this connect to larger social issues? I would say it's a bit of both. I would say that if we get ourselves in a mode where all of these big issues, uh, big societal issues, uh, we don't allow ourselves to produce in the world until we, in, unless we're producing towards those big issues specifically, then I think we probably won't end up solving those big issues. I think sometimes we have to just act in the world and, and produce, and then we're uh, in that production, then we see what happens. So for instance, the banana chair, I don't, I don't, I probably at that time in my life, I wouldn't have told you, you know, uh, most of our thinking as humans is metaphorical in nature. I, I don't know that I would have known that at that time, but it, it, I was compelled. It was an interesting thing to me. So I guess what I'd say is I don't know why I'm interested in certain things, and you probably don't know why you're interested in certain things, but I would just trust yourself if you are interested in those things. And I'm, I'm, I think it's a great question because I think it's we do have so many big problems to solve, right? And so I could see somebody saying, this world is falling apart and this guy is making an octopus chair. What is happening here? Like, what, why, is, why is that important? But in some of the things we can kind of point to that are falling apart in our world, they're falling apart not because we don't know how to solve the problem. They're falling apart because we cannot get together to solve the problem. We have the intellect, we have the technical ability, we have all these things. We can't get together to solve it. And so sometimes it's almost like um, when the, the sort of war is absolutely unfortunate and one hopes it never happens, right? But at the same time, when wars do happen, technologies emerge. A lot of our information technology emerged out of prep for warfare or trying to figure things out that other people are doing. Uh, my brother once said, we should not travel to space until we fix what we have going on right here. Assuming, and I love my brother to death, but he was wrong about this one, assuming that our traveling to space might not make us happen upon something that will solve the problems we have right here. So I think we just have to trust ourselves. You're, you're a single individual in the world, and you may be compelled to solve these big issues, and you should do that if you're compelled to do that. Uh, but we should also allow people their space, their freedom, to solve and to do things that may end up being the thing that, that, that helps with some of these bigger issues. So that's my take on I think it's a great question, though. Any other thoughts, questions? Yeah. I think that part of um, 
The reason I was intrigued by the octopus chair is that there's people who are like, never imagine a chair um, floating on helium and this is just a different way of thinking. And sometimes I think that in order to solve some of these bigger issues is we need to rely on people who created a banana chair because no one was thinking about that. Yeah. So it offers a different perspective of a potential solution that people wouldn't have thought of by stereotypical normal yeah. ways of going about it. I think that's a great way to say it. Yeah, and, it's, and again, it gets back to the Van Arbor Bush thing. Let's allow each other our space, our creative space. And sometimes when we, um, I got in trouble recently uh, with my sister-in-law. My, <laughs> I don't even, I really shouldn't tell this story. But anyway, I got in trouble with my sister-in-law because we were, we were sitting down. They told me that, uh, I think it was Texas, banned uh, gas stoves. I think it was Texas. I can't remember. But anyway. Um, no, California banned gas stoves. California again uh, banned gas stoves. And I asked the question, how, does that mean they're going to use more electricity? Uh, and they've already had troubles with their electrical grid. I didn't know whether that, what the answer to that was, but she just started yelling at me about the gas stoves cause asthma and they blow up and they kill people and all this kind of stuff. And so we just got in a yelling match, just like, ugh, you know, it was just terrible. And it was like, man, just let's have some space to talk about things and to think about things. Like, I was just asking the question. California has trouble with their electrical grid. They're taking all the gas stoves offline, putting them in the electrical. Does electrical cause environmental problems too? It's simply a question. It's not that I know the answer at all. And so I think sometimes we get so, like, amped up. Uh, I'm going to say this, and I, I think I said this in my interview as well, but I don't know that many of you were here or heard, heard that. And I know this is going to sound like or easy for him to say kind of thing, but I, I really believe this. We live in the greatest time. We live in the greatest place, generally speaking. And I would, if somebody wonders about that, and there's so many ways you could wonder about that, what I would say is imagine yourself picked up by an invisible hand, just like this, and that invisible hand could put you anywhere on the earth in its history at any time, anywhere in the earth geographically at any time in its history. Would you choose now or would you take your chances, right? That doesn't mean that it proves my point, but we live in such a great time. So many great things to be thankful for, so many great technologies, but we also have huge problems to solve. And we are gonna have to give people the space to solve those problems and be able to listen to people as they're asking questions about these things. That's what I would want out of these things. But I, I, I think that's great what you just said. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Um, so, like you mentioned that chair. You mentioned that you, and no one can like actually sit on that chair. This one, yeah. And this is not the only thing the first chair that I've seen that's like mm -hmm. really uncomfortable, you know, yeah. like praised by like art. Like, maybe right, 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 yeah. Should we like also keep in mind like architecture you're creating it for like people to use? And people yeah. Like, sometimes. For, My answer would be sometimes. Like, why you create something that, like, you know, it's not. Because you have to, again, you have to be able to create something like imagine any process where like imagine the Eames imagine Charles and Ray Eames sitting down and designing a piece of furniture and they get that first prototype and they and you sit in and you're like god the lumbar that's not very good why did you do it to get to the next one you do it to get to the next one you do it to better it you do this one so you can attach a fishing line and say hey can we structure that oh you can structure how thin can we get this wood mixture you know, you do it just a test. And the, the space that I'm talking about is a space that allows for that testing. And I would also say that not all chairs are built purely for comfort. Because if all chairs were built purely for comfort, they would look a lot like Lazy Boy recliners. And so we, there's a place for a Lazy Boy recliner. My, by the way, I don't know if I show it to you, but I'll show you my, my 78 year old parents. Uh, I, I actually have Lazy Boy recliners in my lecture just so you can see a comfortable uh, chair. My parents are probably at home right now reclined like this on Lazy Boy recliners. Like, 
there's a place for that. But some chairs you put in the space, it transforms the space. Sometimes there's a bed created in the city in South Carolina. The guy didn't want people to stay in his house too long, guests and stuff. He made the bed a little bit uncomfortable. So sometimes, sometimes you don't make things just for comfort. You make things because they're a, a transformation of the space. But also just in the processes, you gotta, you gotta be able to iterate a hundred times to get to that thing that's just right, you know? And, and that one, we, we, didn't, we just didn't get there. We didn't iterate it that many times. It, it would, I wouldn't wanna make it intentionally uncomfortable unless I wanted people just to leave my house. Um, I did create a chair once that I built only part of that the students are you're gonna think I'm crazy for this one, but like the chair leaned forward like this and I was gonna put them in my office at Idaho because I noticed that the students would come into my office and they'd be leaning back like this and I wanted them to engage with me so I wanted the chair to like force them forward. <laughs> that never got built. When I told a student I was doing that, they're like, I'm not coming to your office ever again because I, I don't know what's in there waiting for me. So anyway, so it's, I just think we, we do some chairs should be comfortable, and some chairs should be a little less comfortable. It's, it, you're not trying to make it uncomfortable, but you're trying to experiment and find new ways of working and sitting and doing things. So, any other thoughts or questions? All right, thank you so much. I appreciate you all coming. <laughs>